really coming to the house tonight and very diverse and I really thank you for coming out and uh, thank you Felicity and Mr. Chen for the lovely tea ceremony. I want to say it is a very, very special opportunity to be here on stage um, to talk about cannabis history in ancient Asia and cannabis as a wellness tool. Um, but I can't take all the credit alone. I've had amazing support from my friends and my peers in the cannabis industry um, to research and also open up conversations within our Asian American communities on the topic of cannabis. And I want to thank the Asian Art Museum for creating this space for us to have this conversation. And finally, I'd like to thank my mom. Mom flew in from Texas to be here tonight. And <laughs> I know my career path has not been very traditional, and I want to thank you for being so open-minded and so supportive. Um, I am very lucky to have you as my mom. So, my name is Monica Hello, and I am the creator of Suweed. Suweed is a blog that is dedicated to using cannabis as a superfood ingredient in the home kitchen. And I offer practical advice for beginners and enthusiasts to holistically understand the use case of cannabis in their lives. So I started this blog about five years ago, and it was to document my sous vide creations, um, my cannabis sous vide creations. Um, at the time, I had herniated a disc. It was an L4, L5 disc herniation, and I had the sciatic to go with it. It was incredibly painful and I could barely get out of bed, couldn't walk down the street, and it was just an incredibly painful and dark time in my life. And not only that, I had been prescribed opioids and nine ibuprofen a day just to manage the pain. And that was, it messed me up. It messed up my stomach, it messed up my head, I just, my quality of life was, was awful. And at some point, I realized I grew up with herbal medicine. I grew up with the traditional Chinese medicine that my mom prepared for me. I didn't grow up popping pills. And it was at that point when I realized I needed something that was gentler on my system. And I wanted to try cooking with cannabis. But I lived in a really strict apartment, and there was a no smoking policy, no cannabis smells wafting around, and that made it really challenging to, to make my edibles. I couldn't use a stove top, I couldn't use a crock pot, because they would just smell too much. Um, but I worked at a sous vide company, and I thought, why don't I sous vide my weed? And, and it worked. Um, so by putting my cannabis in oil inside of a bag, sealing it up, and putting it under water to cook and infuse, I was able to discreetly make the medicine that I needed to heal myself. And I was, you know, I was just documenting everything for my blog. And I was just having fun with it. I was stuck at home anyway. I was incapacitated. So it was just a fun, creative outlet for me. And somehow it started to open up all these doors. And I came from a traditional advertising background. I was a designer and I worked on TV commercials and print ads, stuff like that. But all of these cannabis brands started to reach out to ask me to work on creative projects for them. Branding, packaging, photo shoots, recipe testing, all of these things that I really enjoyed doing. I loved doing this. And cannabis just became this intersection between my passions and my skill set. So the reason why I'm here, um, Allison mentioned before, we connected because of my tattoos. And as a food lover, I love to collect tattoos of herbs and spices when I travel and whenever I have a major milestone in my life. And the idea behind that is, hopefully, by the time I die, I will be well seasoned. <laughs> so Allison and Indra saw me in the book and we connected and we started talking about it while they were planning this amazing exhibit and it just took off from there. So today I'm here to talk about the incredibly rich and wonderful history that we have, um, and the campus history that we have in ancient Asia. And I want to talk about food, fiber, um, how it was used for medicine, and even spiritualistic purposes. I also want to talk about the prohibition 
and all the ways that it's changing in modern times through more education and more research. I also want to preface that I'm going to be coming from a perspective of an Asian American, and specifically a Taiwanese American. I never lived in Asia, so there's a lot of cultural nuances that I'm still learning. So tonight's talk will be based around the discoveries, the research, and the conversations that we're having here in the cannabis industry. So the earliest known um, discovery, uh, the earliest discovery of cannabis uh, was in Taiwan and in China. And it was so integral to life that it was named one of the top five grains. So that goes along with rice, barley, millet, and soybeans. Um, so in this image, we're going to see a clay pot. And it's decorated with a hemp twine that's wrapped around it. And this was unearthed in Taiwan in 4000 BC. Ma is the Chinese character for hemp or cannabis, and it is 3,000 years old. It's incredibly old, and you can see that the Chinese had a very special relationship to this plant, because um, there are different characters for the male plant, female, and all the different parts. And it's also been said that the word marijuana could have come from the Mexican immigrants who heard the Chinese immigrants calling it calling cannabis Ma Ren Huang, and that directly translates to hemp seed flower. This is a page from the modern edition of the Shen Nong Fen Cao Jing. Shen Nong Fen Cao Jing is a book of herbal medicine that was written in the second century by a man named Shen Nong, and he is considered the father of Chinese herbal medicine. He mentions that cannabis was used to, um, it was really good for the five vital organs and that it could help bring the body's yin and yang back into balance. In the fourth century, there was, um, in the fourth century, Taoist texts mention cannabis being used in incense burners um, to invoke the immortals and to speak with the ancestors. Um, and one of these ancestors and immortals was Ma Gu. Ma Gu is the hemp goddess or hemp maiden, and she is a symbol of longevity and um, rebirth, and she was also a protector of females. She's kind of like the OG feminist. And <laughs> to celebrate her, um, the Taoists were to pick cannabis on the seventh day of the seventh month to prepare for a day full of seance banquets. Um, it sounds like a pretty amazing party. <laughs> um, so I had this awesome opportunity to interview a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. And she helped me translate some Chinese texts on cannabis. And she mentions that she's never personally uh, prescribed it to any of her clients, but she's not against it at all. So unfortunately, cannabis is still a pretty forbidden topic now in China and a lot of texts were lost, and there's not a lot of information out there, it's hard to come by. But as we saw before, um, the Chinese had many different classifications on cannabis, so I would like to share three of them with you guys today. There's Marin, which is the hemp seed, and Shen Nong said that it's good for constipation, fatigue, postpartum, when there's too much bleeding. Um, and then they made this breakfast porridge out of the hemp seed and uh, with other nuts and seeds, and they ate that for a boost of energy. There's Ma Bo, which is the male hemp blood, uh, bud, and he said that it was good for women's health, um, and it was good for treating intestinal parasites. They also made this honey syrup, and they cooked it down and used that to treat numbness and paralysis. And finally, there's the moxibustion technique. So moxibustion is when they burn dried herbs, mostly mugwort, traditionally used as mugwort these days. And, but back in the day, they used mugwort and hemp. And they would roll it into the cigar shape and, and burn it and hold the smoke up to their skin to treat skin diseases, or they would also hold it up to acupuncture points. Finally, there is malan. 
Malan is the cannabis flower, the female flower with THC. And he says that it is good for treating seizures, and if you consume, it has a calming effect, but if you consume too much, it can also cause your paranoia. Um, also, he mentions don't eat it with clams. For some reason, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm kind of curious to find out. Um, and then also treats insomnia and menstrual problems. Um, the really cool thing about this is it all aligns with our modern day use cases. So what's up with prohibition then? So in 1912, uh, China joined the International Opium Convention, and it was led by 13 nations, and it was only to um, set protocols on drug trafficking and restrict exports. Um, that was it. And for decades after that, it was just, you know, mostly regulations on opiates and narcotics, nothing about cannabis until 1961 when they started regulating cannabis a little bit more. But still, it was, it was pretty loose. It wasn't until 1985, under the heavy, heavy influence of the United States, that China joined the International Drug Control Conventions. And that regulated cannabis much, much more heavily, and they classified it as a narcotic. So it wasn't until the 80, until 85, guys, and um, that was when, you know, under the influence of the U.S., that China started to crack down on cultivation of cannabis and hemp, and they kind of did it as this blanket ban, um, which caused major, major confusion because this stuff just grew wild. So the farmers, and especially the the minor, the ethnic minorities, they were just incredibly confused on like, what do we do? It just grows wild on all the mountainsides. Um, but still to this day, China is the largest producer of hemp in the entire world. They produce up to uh, over 70% of um, the world's output of hemp. And not only that, China holds the most cannabis and hemp patents in the entire world, over 300 out of 609. So right now, there are tons of advocacy groups and leaders that are in the industry who are helping to course correct and open up conversations within the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. And I founded Asian Americans for Cannabis Education back in 2015 for this very reason. I founded it with Ophelia Chong and Tiffany Wu, and we started it because we wanted to be the responsible face of cannabis, and we wanted to help dispel myths and stigmas around this incredibly beneficial plants. And we hope that our transparency into the industry um, and our journey into the industry would help inspire others to join as well. But it's 2019 and we have so many amazing groups out there now who are helping to pave the way for people of color to educate themselves and, and join in, in the industry. And I want to give a big shout out to Grass by Grass and Equity Sessions. I think their um, networking events and their resources are just incredibly, incredibly important. And you can get their information right there. And you can also go to my blog under the resources to find out more about you know, how you can get involved. And also links to share. There's a lot of research links and stuff like that in there. So we're seeing a lot more media coverage these days from CNN, Washington Post, The Guardian, just on this topic. And I think it's incredible, incredible for awareness and visibility. Um, researchers have found remnants of high THC cannabis up in the mountainsides of Western China. And this discovery uh, leads to the intentional use of cannabis being inhaled during um, burial rites. And it turns out the Chinese were the first to smoke weed as well. <laughs> All right, so that's all in our past, and now we're gonna fast forward to modern day traditional Chinese medicine. Um, I think it's important to note that most practitioners do not learn about traditional, I mean, do not learn about cannabis in school. A lot of these 
um, techniques and information was passed out through lineage, which meant a lot of information was lost during the wars and the Cultural Revolution. It wasn't until the 1950s um, that traditional Chinese medicine was standardized, but it was standardized through the lens of a communist government. So currently there are two modern schools of thought. Um, the anti-cannabis practitioners say that it's a catch-22. With recreational use, cannabis can be abused, and then the practitioners will have to go back and fix whatever went wrong. So for example, I use cannabis for anxiety, um, like a lot of people do, but if you consume too much cannabis, it can also cause your anxiety. Um, on the flip side, the pro-cannabis practitioners say they're really into using it as um, a wellness tool, but there needs to be more standardization, and there needs to be more education around it. Um, everybody metabolizes cannabis differently. Some people are more sensitive than others, and we just have so many different physiological factors that are involved that it is really difficult to prescribe. But it is. Um, so the main concern um, within the medical communities is the lack of education, and I completely agree. But it's 2019, and we are starting to see some shifts. With more clinical research, we're able to guide healthcare decisions and inform public policy a little better. And with legalization, more and more colleges and universities are starting to add cannabis studies into their curriculum. So hopefully all of that combined will help pave the way for a stronger and more responsible industry. So at this point, I want to bring Felicity from Hotly back up here. Is a Asian American female run cannabis company that is making pantry items for the home kitchen. And I want to say that Felicity and I connected over an infused dinner uh, hosted by the Earth Song there. <laughs> and it was a lovely dinner, and I was so excited that there was another Asian American in this industry. Um, there wasn't a lot of us at the time. <laughs> and I like happy to say that we get to work together now. I got to help uh, Felicity and Christine rebrand Hotly, and I got to work on the packaging with them. So I've got some questions for you. Awesome. Let's awesome. Do it. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself, Felicity. What is your background, and what's your relationship to cannabis? How did you start Hotly? Yeah. So uh, my name is Pot My name is Felicity. I'm one of the founders of Hotly. Uh, and earlier, my dad was here um, making the tea. He is a Taoist. Um, it's not really a religion, it's more of a way of life. Um, and that way of life is um, all about balance, right? If you're feeling sick, if there's something wrong with your yin and your yang. Um, I grew up in a household where traditional Chinese medicine was used. Um, if I was ever sick, uh, I would have to uh, take this drink out of this bag, it's called Ben and it's on tea. And you're like, what's that? I don't know what it is, but I drank it and then the next day I was feeling better. Um, and so that was how my dad um, uh, and, and how I grew up. Well, in his office, I remember uh, there was this naked man and it had a bunch of different pressure points. It had lines going on throughout its body. Uh, and, uh, and I would be like, Dad, why do you have this in your office? It's a little strange, but you can explain that um, all of these things are, you know, connected in your body, and if you push, push under this pressure point, it might, you know, um, help restore that balance. And so that was very much instilled uh, into my life. I mean, you know, growing up, um, didn't take any Tylenol or Advil, drank some tea, and went to bed. And the next day, I was feeling better. Uh, and. Um, and my dad really brought that into our family business. Um, my family business is passed down from my mother's side. Um, we own we an international food company. It's a, a wholesale distribution um, and manufacturing for over 40 years. We produce specialty sauces and spices um, and distribute to um, Chinese restaurants, Asian you know, supermarkets all over the US. 
Um, so I grew up in a, also in a, a special household where I only eat Chinese food, you know, um, and I only had the opportunity to, you know, eat at, um, uh, I, I, you know, I grew up eating at restaurants. And um, I'm really lucky in that my dad um, brought this whole wellness aspect to Chinese food. It's about balance. We three times a day, you know, food is so important to health, plant medicine is so important to health, so this is how I grew up, um, and this is what I understand is the norm. Uh, and um, uh, my co-founder and I, I'm so lucky to be owning and um, managing this business with another badass Asian American female, she's here somewhere, <laughs> over there. Uh, and. Uh, we uh, really started uh, this idea, this concept behind how do we make something that even our parents would understand, right? Like we kind of started this business incognito, like we didn't really tell our parents we were going to the cannabis industry, we were kind of like surprised. Now you have to support us, don't you support me mom, <laughs> support me dad. But uh, what we wanted to do was create something um, that even they would get. So we started an edibles company. We started with infusing our honey. The honey is harvested in my family home, which is in the East Bay. So it's all love, local, hyper-local honey um, that we infuse with cannabis and CBD, um, THC. Uh, and, and from that, you know, we started getting a little bit of traction. Um, and we launched um, our olive oil and then our chili oil. And now it's become this whole concept about this kitchen pantry, right? In the edibles category and the edibles space, uh, most of the um, items are confections, they're um, sweet, um, and um, they're meant for recreational use. They're meant to eat right before you go out or so you can get high. Um, uh, uh, and I don't know, potentially go to sleep, uh, whatever you need to use it for. But as a, as, a, as a chocolate, as a gummy, it's not something that you really, um, that's not something that's already part of your routine, right? I eat chocolates, you know, when I have menstrual cramps, but I don't eat it every single day um, on the dot. But with honey, you know, that's something that you can potentially add into your tea every day if that's part of your morning routine. It's something that you add into your coffee every day if, it's, if that's part of your routine. And olive oil, you cook with it every day, right? And chili oil, um, what you try today is something that you can infuse into your daily wellness routine. And so that is our mission, and that is our thesis, and that's how we think that we're going to um, take the world, potentially, because um, we, we are so sure that this is how we can bring cannabis to the masses. Awesome. Um, and I, I love that. And I, I want to hear a little bit more about your experience joining the cannabis industry as well, especially as two Asian American women. Yeah. You know, what kind of challenges did you face? What kind of triumphs did you face when you were starting your company? Uh, well, we're still trying to see these challenges up until today. It's really having a seat at the table. Right. Um, as to like women um, in a industry that's dominated by males, and right now we're going through fundraising as a company, we're fundraising our seed round, and uh, we were really proud to have a whole team of women on uh, uh, that, that power pot, like our whole team of 10 people that um, are part of our group, it's all women, and that's awesome. And I remember, it was just a few days ago actually, that I was um, telling an investor this, I was really excited, and they were like, oh, well, that must be fun. And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> I didn't say that at all, but it, 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 it really felt like, you know, um, that we weren't being taken seriously because we were a group of women. Not that we, wow, um, having a group of women is really powerful. Um, and so it's just, it's, 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 the, the challenge is having that voice and having a seat at the table and being taken seriously. But, you know, it's balanced by so many more triumphs. Right, like um, it's so cool that I get to work with Monica. Uh, it's so cool that um, I get to uh, represent my heritage and now bring it into my business and um, and, and live it every day and, and, and bring it forward. And it's so cool that uh, we're, we're changing history. Uh, it's 
it's 2019, we're in California, we're in San Francisco, and this is the first time that people get to really innovate um, and create a legal space, and we're doing everything correctly, we're doing everything right, um, and so and there's so many triumphs that come with it, and so uh, we're lucky, it's um, yeah. all the challenges are worth it. Yes. I mean, and it's 2019, yes, let's talk more about the uh, current state of cannabis. Um, where are we now in terms of accessibility and diversity? Yeah, so, well, we're really lucky, right? California is a legal state. San Francisco is one of the oldest um, economies that was medicinal and also recreational. So in San Francisco, we have access, right? We have access to cannabis, to dispensaries. We have events like this where people can learn more about cannabis. Um, and um, I, we're really lucky, you know, we, we have access, but not yet to the rest of the world. And um, we're, we're trying to make that change, right? We're trying to make that difference. Um, we're trying to showcase um, and normalize cannabis. Um, people like uh, Monica, people like me, you know, we're high-performing, high-functioning people. Um, and, and we use cannabis every day to keep us moving forward. So um, I think that's one main part of it. Uh, the other part, I think, is uh, is that uh, one of the cannabinoids, CBD, has really started to normalize violence. What CBD is, is the um, non-intoxicating cannabinoid in the cannabis plant. And CBD, I mean, everybody is kind of like taken over the press. It's, um, you see it at CBS, you see it you know, everywhere. Um, and it's really starting to normalize because you can buy it anywhere. You can buy it directly online, you can buy it um, at a grocery store. Um, my mom, like, it was what I like, got her to start using cannabis in the first place uh, because she, you know, recently broke her arm, but like, she, she fell and she had a lot of pain and CBD is great for anti-inflammatory. And, and I went to the office the other day and I saw the jar there and I'm like, mom, you've been using the, the CBD. And she's like, yeah, it's working. You know, and it's not, um, it's plant medicine, right? It, it, if you take pharmaceuticals, it might stop the pain, but it doesn't help it get better. Um, CBD is helping restore the balance. Um, and so that was something that she could understand. And um, I'm really, uh, I think we're, we're at a really fortunate place where, um, you know, CBD is now like kind of the gateway to, um, access and um, accessibility and understanding cannabis as a whole. And I think all the CBD um, media and noise out there right now is, is pretty important in terms of like visibility and awareness and, and I think it's driving a lot of changes as well. So just yesterday, um, I think it's important to know that yeah, just yesterday there was a meeting in Congress to discuss the legalization of uh, cannabis on a federal level. And I think that's super cool. Yeah, exciting stuff. And it's not to discuss whether or not we should legalize it or not. It's how we are going to legalize it. So legalization is coming on a massive scale. And you know, we have to be 33 uh, states that are rec um, medical, and then uh, another God, how many that are recreational. So it's like more than half of the country is you know has already legalized cannabis. And I think it's just really important, you know, that we keep talking about it, we keep learning, and we keep researching, and, um, you know, that way we can be better be responsible consumers. Final question, because I know everybody's hungry. Um, what does the future of Potley look like? Um, the future of Potley is about taking over your kitchen pantry, one staple ingredient at a time. So uh, I, I guess I, didn't, I haven't uh, talked a little bit about our products. We have our honey, which is our, you know, premier product that we harvest ourselves. Uh, it's all local to California and hyper local to everybody here today. Great for your allergies, but also for overall well-being. Um, we have an olive oil that uh, is from Carmel Valley. Um, it's so important for us to um, talk about the ingredients, California grown ingredients that are just so good, um, so delightful, and spread it to the rest of the nation and hopefully the rest of the world. And our, our chili oil is actually a recipe that has been passed down from generations of my family. Um, it's what you guys tasted today, um, and it's actually a, a, a recipe from you company so it's it's about adding more ingredients that are staple kitchen ingredients so that you know 
you know, hopefully um, as we um, expand this line, you know, we will, you know, we're, we're going to take over the, the kitchen pantry, and um, and uh, and we're going to add more ingredients that you know may pay homage to our heritage. We're going to add ingredients that um, uh, you know you might be using already in, in your daily life. And that's super important to us to, to cre create products that are easily contextualized, that um, are talking and make this um, about this whole holistic wellness routine for you. So, yeah, that's pretty cute. Good. I can't wait. Yeah. Um, so, I think at this point we can open up for QA. Okay, I have one here. <laughs> Very practical and non-business uh, related question, but are your products shelf stable? I mean, how does that work? I mean, I, I don't know enough about the longevity of a cannabis and a food product and whether that, you know, how that okay. affects. Right? Great question. So the question was about how does the cannabis ex affect the longevity of the product? So honey itself is an extremely shelf stable. It's, it basically never goes bad. Um, when you uh, pair the cannabis with that, uh, we use an extract. So we uh, work with scientists um, and lab technicians. They uh, take the cannabis, they process it, and make it into an oil, and then we infuse the oil into the cannabis. We say that the shelf life, because of the cannabis, is two years. Uh, but it can be extended for much more than that, uh, uh, just just because of how the honey itself um, it increases the shelf life. But um, on our packages, we say two years. And olive oil, olive oil does have an expiration date. It's about uh, a year after harvest is um, really when it should um, go bad and you should replace your olive oil. Uh, but it is also something that you use more often, and, um, and you should replace. Um, Annual basis, I guess, or not, whatever you want now. Oh man, I go through my like once a week. So. Yeah, just all over. Yeah. Can we get your popping products online? Yes. And the other question is, um, how do we invest? Oh. Uh, our partner's right there. We have our turn sheets ready. We'll send it over to your email. Um, we are uh, definitely fundraising right now. Um, and where can you get our products? Our products are on potlyshop.com. That's P-O-T-L-I shop.com. Those are for our CBD products. So hemp derived CBD, non-intoxicating, all about just you know rebalancing your body. And uh, for me, I use it for my anxiety. We have honey sticks, you know, wherever you know. Uh, it's it's awesome. It's great and it's straightforward. Um, our cannabis products you can buy at Vapor Room in the city. Uh, we're also at Vasa uh, and also my favorite delivery, which is GetSava.com, um, delivers straight to your door. And you can call and um, talk to their um, concierge. They're really great at helping you find products that are good for you. So, yeah. Hi. I'm over here. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, how can you talk a little bit about the process of talking to aunties and members of your community about what you do? Totally. It starts by where they're having pain, right? I think the easiest way to get to my mother was when she had an accident and uh, fell and hurt her, her arm. And, um, and then my dad happened to not be home. <laughs> Sorry, mom and dad. Um, and I was like, I've got something that you should try, you know. Um, and and uh, I think that's the best way. So like, where are you already having pain? Is it insomnia? Um, is it joint? Is it just overall general inflammation? Like, and then from that, you know, really target that area um, and then show the evidence and show the research and show how that can help them. Um, and start by something topical, like this won't affect your mind, you know, this will just make you feel better. I mean, I don't know why you would try that. Yeah, I think your, your products are really easy, like, there's like a low barrier to entry. It's just yeah. like honey, it's all like stuff that you eat in your food already. So I definitely think that's like a great way to introduce cannabis to them. Um, but also sharing uh, research papers and articles and news articles that's been going around. Um, there's a lot of new information 
information out there. And that's how I got my parents to kind of be okay with it. Initially, I was just sending them articles daily until they were so annoyed and they're like, okay, I get it. It's it's looking. <laughs> Time for medical uses of cannabis. Yes. On that. Yeah, so if you go to my blog, suweed.com, there's a link to the resources page, and I've collected a bunch of links already. So there's how to use uh, cannabis, um, just the basics, and then there's also medical research links as well, and then other links for how to get involved in the industry. And if you ever are looking for just someone to talk to, get Sava, there's a phone number right there. And they're great for you know just having someone um, on hand to just ask questions about cannabis and what would be the best fit for you. Um, so most of your products are online. Do you ever see the future of it actually being distributed in regular retail stores? Yeah, definitely. We How so, close are you to that? Uh, we are... We're doing it. <laughs> we're trying to get um, into the high-end retailers. We're working on wholesale accounts. We're working on getting into grocers. Uh, we are in uh, a number, a handful of grocers in San Francisco. San Francisco has some um, interesting regulations around hemp drive CBD products, but uh, you can find our uh, THC products at dispensaries and then um, our wholesale products um, at Dolores Outpost in San Francisco, and I will get back to you with the wisdom. But you can go to polyshop.com and it has all of our retailers. Um, but yeah, getting into groceries is definitely one of our plans. Hi, um, when you first started to cook with your marijuana and sous vide your weed, did you have any kitchen mishaps? What didn't work? Oh my goodness, uh, a lot. Uh, so I use mason jars a lot as well, um, and the glass has to be uh, tempered. <laughs> I definitely used uh, just I'm like, oh, it's a, it's a regular jar. I'll just put my stuff in it, and I put it in, and it just it broke. So um, oil and cannabis everywhere. It was a mess. So there's really great silicone bags now. You can use a Ziploc bag, um, mason jars that are tempered. <laughs> um, yes. Oh, avoid the mess that way. Yes, uh, Sue, could you give us an idea of what kind of edibles uh, you make and are available? And uh, can you tell us anything about price ranges? Yeah, so we have our honey, and that comes in a jar. For our, our THC one, that's $45. Um, our honey, it's a six ounce jar, it's 54. Uh, for the hemp drive CBD, 120 milligrams. And we also have our honey sticks. Those are six bucks. Uh, and those are uh, made with biodegradables, corn straws, uh, and uh, yeah, those are, those are a delight. Those are our premier product. Hyper local as well. Um, and then our olive oil is $45, and uh, and we also have mini versions, also $6.50. Um, and then our chili oil is $6.50 for the little mini guy. Uh, Hi, um, I'm Jason. To be like the front lines. Um, yeah, there were a lot of, you know, really strange, like, old wives' tales that we would hear. And so we would try to go out and dispel them as best as we could. Um, but like I mentioned, like, for my mom and my dad, when they were, when I first told them that I was, you know, joining this industry, they were extremely concerned. And they were like, oh my god, my dog is a drug dealer. <laughs> what do I do? What are people going to say? And 
I just started just collecting all sorts of articles and newsprints and um, old history notes, and I was just sending it to them all the time until they just got super annoyed. Um, but you know, I, there there's still a lot of misconceptions, and especially in, in China too, where it's such a forbidden topic to talk about. And, um, but they're starting to legalize across the world. Um, Canada is legal. Um, there's a ton of other countries too that are medical um, as well. And you know, with more information and with more research, I think people are going to start coming around. For me, um, it was about uh, smoking. My parents are like, smoking is not okay. I still think it's not okay. Um, and that's why I started an edible, edibles company, right? For health reasons um, and for sustainability. So it was just like, parents support me. Also, um, we're trying to do something that is ingrained in bringing health um, for long-term use. I, um, as a Chinese American who's been in the industry for over 30 years, I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. And my question is, as far as the legalities and like the permits that are required, you know, to, to do the manufacturing and for the THC products. Like, what permits are required, and what, what did it entail to get those permits? So, in San Francisco, we have our permits from the Office of Cannabis for Manufacturing. Um, you have to first get that, and and in order to get that, you have to apply, and in order to apply, you have to find a space in a place that's zoned correctly for manufacturing, and there's really not that many spaces. So we're in the Bayview in San Francisco, we're super local, um, and we went through the process in 2017. We were uh, pre-existing, conforming um, uh, campus entity. We applied, uh, we found our space, uh, and then from with our San Francisco Office of Campus Permits, we then applied at the state level. So we got our San Francisco, uh, uh, sorry, the California Department of Public Health. Um, we have our manufacturing type end license, and we also have our distribution license um, that allows us to sell directly to dispensaries. Um, and so that has been. It's, it's taken like two years, um, and we now have our annual licenses, which is really exciting, but they're still provisional. <laughs> so, you know, things are still like, it's, everything takes really long in the state to happen, but we, we have done everything by the book. Um, we have done every inspection by the book, um, and we wanted to do it right legally. Um, and um, yeah, we are definitely uh, happy and um, uh, welcome to consult anyone that wants to, you know, go through the permitting process because we've done it and it's definitely not an easy one. Do you source from just one grower or do you look at it like wine? Yeah. And where does the, like, based on your discussion of ancient Chinese use of uh, um, how do you determine which uh, uh, Yeah, I'm so glad. This is such a great question. So the question is like, how do you, how do we determine where we source from and what we infuse into our products? So we only source from the Emerald Triangle, which is Humble County up north. That's where it's basically the Napa Valley of cannabis, right? It's um, where um, uh, cannabis grows outside, sun grown not indoor, um, and we particularly are very, uh, that's really important to our ethos to source from the Emerald Triangle. And then we work with our extractors, our extractors find different farmers, either you know, um, family farms or small grows, and then they um, extract all of the cannabinoids, it's this full spectrum uh, extraction, right? It's really important to collect, you know, not just the THC and the CBD, but the CBG, CBN, and all of that, we take everything, um, and, then, and then, because of legalization, we have to test so many times, so we test, 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 test for all the potency and all of this and all of that, and we can see exactly, you know, what that, uh, what is in our plant, what has been extracted, and all the terpenes that came with it, you know, all the flavors, right? Um, from that, once we have all of that information, we, we then, we really, we go and we smell everything. 
Um, I go, I smell everything, um, and based off of the harvest of the honey, because we um, harvest you know, seasonally, um, we pair um, the extract to that season's harvest. Um, and so we typically, so for our THC, we source sativa. Sativa is typically uh, more uplifting, uh, and uh, we uh, pair, uh, you know, we even sometimes look at the terpene profile to see if it's, you know, something that is more calming, it's more used for anxiety, it's more used for uh, balance, and we take all that into consideration, and we pair the uh, honey to, well, also the olive oil and the chili oil, but we pair um, the, the cannabis to um, our raw material in that way. So it's super important to us. Also, you can find our stories of all of our farmers and all of the tasting notes online on um, getholly.com. Do you publish a new recipes? Yeah. Yes. So my my blog is filled with recipes. I think there's over like 300 recipes at this point. There's a lot. <laughs> um, okay, but that is a lot of potty recipes. Yeah, it's a lot of it. It's potty recipes as well. So you can go on suzuki.com and find all these recipes and then the ones that we've collaborated on are on there as well. Um, but, you know, like Phil mentioned, I like to do strain specific as well. I have you know, different strains and different infusions for different purposes. So, you know, I, I really encourage you to try making your own medicine at home. It's a very cost-efficient way. Um, but if you don't do a lot of cooking, I think pantry items from Potley are a really, really great, great way to incorporate things into your lifestyle and your meals as well. Yes. All taken by Monica. All this. It's amazing. And everything that Potley, like all the outside packaging, is all Monica. And it's just, it's awesome. Thank you. Oh my gosh. It's beautiful. Everything, the first thing that people usually comment about is like, wow, your packaging is beautiful. I was like, thanks. Monica made it. Oh. <laughs> it's my friend Monica. She's pretty cool. It's a very fun thing to be at. I'm very lucky. So, Monica, when can we expect your cookbook, and do you need tasters? <laughs> uh, I am trying to manifest that right now. I would love to have a cookbook deal. Um, so, yeah, I'm working on a proposal right now as well, so if you guys know anymore. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Can one specify the kinds of terpenes? They go with the order. In other words, if you're looking for, let's say, high lemony content specifically, do you cover that or is that still uh, For poly products? Yes. Uh, I don't think so right now. Not terpene specific. Not terpene specific, no. Okay, thank you. So, so great. Um, and then the second question. 
uh, Sunburn versus Indo. Okay. So that's just a preference for me. Um, there are people that grow really great in North Flower, but for me, it's just it's about like carbon footprint and um, you know it's just um, so much energy that's kind of. Um, that goes into you know having a bunch of lights in the door, and um, unfortunately, you know when um, there used to be a lot of federal raids, like it had to move a lot of the farmers that were growing outside in, and because we just became legalized, there's just not there's there's still big cultural people that grow in door, and sometimes the door weed is really great, but it's also really really strong, and so my preference is to um, uh, is to buy the side grown flower. Uh, because that's how plants are naturally grown. But that's just your reference. Those are good questions. I know. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, cannabis does help you feel a little bit more balanced, 
more at ease, and it helps bring stress levels down. So I am in the links, um, sumi.com slash resources. I have links about the endocannabinoid system. So it was pretty recently, I feel like it was in the 80s when they discovered it, and they're like, oh yeah, our stress levels, everything, our adrenal glands, everything goes through the endocannabinoid system. I think a better word for balance is like homeostasis. Yeah, it's homeostasis in your body. I was thinking I had problems with balance, so I thought I would have to with my balance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting that it ties back with the traditional Chinese medicine, yin yeah. yang, right? It's right. all about like creating balance in your body. Um, yeah, the, so. the ancient Chinese were onto something, you know, and it wasn't until modern day where they're like, oh. <laughs> we're like now it's like in the trend now, plant-based medicine, yeah. holistic health, <laughs> returning to the root. We're just like. Exactly. Resurfacing what we already know. Thank you so much for coming out. Yes. <laughs>